Oh my gosh, it worked. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Those who had the resolve to stick it out it was a little longer than 10 minutes. I had a grandchild collective meltdown. And um, yeah, so that's resolved. And it looks like my technical difficulties are also resolved. Can you guys hear me on? I can't tell if my YouTube mic is working. I see the, um, let's see, I see, can someone on YouTube tell me if they hear my mic? Um, so now on Facebook, I know my mic is working, but I'm wondering on my live stream on YouTube, if the mic is working or, um, if I am not being heard. So, uh, Frank, if you could do me a favor, if you could log on to the live on um, my YouTube page and tell me if that is, if you can hear the mic. I can't tell. Um, let's see. Okay, well, um, I don't know what to do about that. I'm trying to see if my YouTube, which I am also live streaming from, I can't tell if the mic is working. Uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. I saw it move. Okay. So it looks like we're in business. So um, right now I am streaming both um, here on Facebook and also... On, let me see if I can get the, um, I'll share this on Facebook right now, the link. So if people want to tune in live on Facebook or live here um, on YouTube, I just posted the link on my home page. Okay, so get that out of the way. Mm. Just give me two more seconds and then I will get to the business at hand and just <laughs> edit this mess out when I um, post the video. Okay. So just so you know, for those that are tuning in <laughs> um, with my little technical difficulties, this is this past week, Saturday, when I started reading this book online, um, was my first time um, doing a live on YouTube. And like I said, I've already read this entire book live on Facebook a little over a year and a half ago and tried to download all of my recordings, which I saved in Facebook. And for whatever reason, the recordings, every single one was awful. You're talking about 52 chapters that I read live online of The Great Cosmic Mother last year and couldn't save a single recording on Facebook. So I'm still doing the live via Facebook, but I also wanted to go ahead and do the live reading of this book on YouTube so I have good quality, um, good quality video saved for future because we are doing the Facebook um, book club group for this book and also... Um, every first and third Thursday of the month, we are doing a class on the book. So I'll be presenting questions um, that are kind of prompt questions about what you should be taking from each section that we read, each chapter that we read and each section that we read. So with that being said, and if anybody can do me a favor and, and um, instead of watching live on Facebook, maybe opening a tab and logging in to watch live on um, YouTube to, to make sure my mic is working. I see the little, you know, thing moving, but ever so slightly. So I just need to make sure that my mic is working and I'm not wasting my breath. So as I mentioned before, my name is Iapo and um, I am also Cassandra. 
And I am reading for the fourth time, but this time live, The Great Cosmic Mother Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth. For those who may want to take a screenshot of the book cover, The Great Cosmic Mother Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth by uh, Monica Zhu and Barbara Moore. This book was written in 1987, and um, it is really of everything that I've written, one of the most important books I've ever read. And that is why I feel the need to share it with you. So um, we're going to get started. Um, I will reiterate again that today we are starting section two, um, women's early religion. And the first chapter in section two is chapter six. This chapter is called The First Mother. Oh, and those that are um, tuning in on live Facebook, if you could do me a favor, log into my YouTube channel, subscribe and like the video. The first mother. Biology is not destiny, but like the sea, it is a beginning. The mysteries of female biology dominated human, religious and artistic thought as well as social organization for at least the first 200,000 years of human life on earth. The first human images known to us are the so-called Venuses found in upper Paleolithic remains, 35,000 to 10,000 BC. From the way these statues are positioned and located in cave hearths, niches, and graves, they are interpreted as cult images the mother guardians of the daily life, death, and rebirth of the people. These Venuses, carved from stone, bone, and ivory, and shaped from clay, are very fleshy, more or less stylized to represent pregnancy and abundance. Though named after Venus, the Roman goddess of love, they are no longer seen by archaeologists as Cro-Magnon bunnies. They are not sex objects. They are magic images of the mysterious power of the female to create life out of herself and to sustain it of herself. The statues have no feet, the legs taper to a point so that the, so they could be struck, they could be stuck upright in a soft hearth or niche. They were placed everywhere. These statues appear in Europe with the appearance of the Cro-Magnons, but much earlier during the Neanderthaloid period, dating from at least 200,000 BC, Evidence shows that great magical power was attributed to the earth as mother of life and death. Neanderthals buried their dead coiled in the fetal position, painted red. Bones were painted with red ochre. Analogously, the dead were to re-enter the earth, the tomb, and the womb to be reborn again. The Neanderthal corpse found in Shanadar Cave in northern Iraq, had been laid to rest on pine boughs and strewn with wild flowers. Even earlier than this, a remarkable find in Le Ferris in the French limestone country shows the beautiful resonance that was left that was felt in the minds and hearts of these earliest people between life, death, and the mother. In a rock shelter, a child's grave was found covered with a large stone slab. And on the underside of the slab, small cupels had been scooped out. These were all in pairs to symbolize the mother's breasts. These breast-shaped cupel markings were made throughout prehistory. They are found over great areas of outcropped rock in Europe. But on this stone slab in France, covering a Neanderthal child's grave is where they first appear. Uh, Mircea, Mircea Eliad, the great student of Aboriginal religious symbolism and shamanism, speaks of a primary intuition of the earth as a religious form. The earth was seen by all primal people as the source of nourishment, protection, power, and the mystery of cyclic reoccurrence. Perhaps the first human analogy made was between the earth and the female who performed the same functions on an, on an individual level. 
Especially awesome was the woman's ability to bleed rhythmically with the moon's phases and her periodic swelling up and dramatic expulsion of a new being. Paintings of the mother giving birth with the expulsed child still connected to her via the umbilical cord are found throughout the Cro-Magnon caves. Childbirth is a powerful drama and ritual. To imagine the enormous impact of pregnancy and childbirth on our human ancestors, we have to remember that Paleolithic people, like many Aboriginal people today, did not know the connection between intercourse and pregnancy. The male role might have been seen as opening the womb, but the pregnancy itself was seen as resulting from a magical intercourse between the mother and the spirit world, or it was seen as a parthenogenic act, the woman as spontaneous and autonomous creator of life. In these cave drawings of childbirth and in the Venus statues, as well as in many images of graved animals, the fertility of earth and woman was imaged and celebrated as a spiritual magical act to ensure the year's abundance of game and fruit. The seasonal return of vegetation and young animal life following winter and apparent death gave early humans the idea of a magical cyclical rebirth of their own kind. Entombments, whether cave graves or the later underground vaults and collective burial mounds, were ways of returning bodies to the womb of Mother Earth, where they waited for rebirth. In the later megalithic portal tombs, holes were laboriously chiseled out of the portal slabs at the grave entrance to simulate, simulate the birth canal opening. Even later in Egypt, the overarching sky goddess Nut was painted on the inside of the coffin lids. This is a lovely echo of that first stone slab placed over the Neanderthal grave with the mother's breast protectively covering and nurturing the dead child as it waited to be, be, to, waited to be reborn. Death, let me mark that. Death is the powerful dramatic mystery equal to birth and both are overarched and contained by the great mother. This concept of a female earth as the source of cyclic birth, death, life, and rebirth underlies all mythological and religious symbology. It is the source of all religious belief. It is important to grasp the time dimension involved. God was female for at least the first 2,000 years of human life on earth. This is a conservative estimate. Wooden images of the mother God were doubtless, car were doubtless carved long before the stone Cro-Magnon Venuses, but wood does not survive. And long before those first breast shapes were carved in the Neanderthal grave slab, where the red ochre bodies were placed in fetal position in the cave earth, the idea, the symbolic image, the resonant analogy preceding all icons was in the minds and the hearts of our earliest ancestors. In the world's oldest creation myths, the female God creates the world out of her own body. The great mother everywhere was the active and autonomous creatrix of the world. And unlike the aloof and self-righteous patriarchal gods who only recently usurped her mountain throne, the ancient goddess was always there, alive, um, imminent, within her creation. No ontological scapegoater. She was wholly responsible for both pain and, good, and the good of life. Here is one of the oldest world creation myths from Northwest India. This is a quote. At first, Kajum Shantu, the earth, was like a human being. She had a head and arms and legs and an enormous fat belly. The original human beings lived on the surface of her belly. One day it occurred to Kajum Shantu that if she ever got up and walked about, everyone would fall off and be killed. So she herself died of her own accord. Her head became the snow-covered mountains. The bones of her back turned into smaller hills. Her chest was the valley where the, um, where the Apatanis live. From her neck came forth, from her neck came the north country of Najins. 
her buttocks turned into the Assam plain. For just as the buttocks are full of fat, Assam has fat, rich soil. Kajum Shantu's eyes became the sun and moon. From her mouth was born Kajum Pop Popi, who sent the sun and moon to shine in the sky, end quote. Mount Everest is nearby Nepal, in, excuse me, Mount Everest in nearby Nepal was only recently affixed with the name of the 19th century British um, surveyor. In reality, this tallest breast of earth was always known by the native people who lived with her as Shomo Long Longma, Mother Mountain of the Universe. That's the end of chapter six. Chapter seven, the organic religion of early, re of early women. The first God, Mother Earth, was a human concept or the sign of a human response to an experienced fact. The first arts and religions, the first crafts and social patterns were designed in recognition and in celebration of her. But what were real human females feeling and thinking? We can only see the attributes of the great goddess as the projection of women's experiences of themselves. As we read the powerful magic signs of the great of the great mother's celebration, we can read these first women's powerful discoveries and celebrations of themselves. The religious beliefs, the mysteries and rites developed by the ancient women grew organically out of women's supreme roles as cultural producers mothers, prime communicators with the spirit world. The mystery, uh, let's see, the mysteries of creation, transformation and, reoccur and recurrence, the primal mysteries of all, all religions emerged from women's direct physical and psychic experiences of these mysteries in bleeding, in, the, in growing a child, in nursing, in working with fire, in making a pot, in planting a seed. In pottery craft and in myth alone, in pottery craft and myth alone, we can see the development of a religion. The pot was seen to have the body shape and internal womb of the mother. The Neolithic Europe and Neolithic Europe, clay was said to have a woman's soul. And no man was allowed to see the female potter at work. Clay, sacred to women and the goddess, was often marked with the maze-like windings of the magic underworld, a place of transformation. Aruru Astar, the cosmic creatrix of Babylon, was imaged as a potter, a divine potter, shaper of life. The making, the making of cult vessels was like this shaping of life. And the Babylonian words for rebirth were, we are as flesh baked pots. Woo! From this, we can see the absurdity and the political co-optation of the notion of a male God father making human beings from clay or dust. Come on. The biblical image is stolen without shame from the earlier Sumerian and Babylonian goddess creation stories. Such a patriarchal version of creation is very recent. The facts of women's experience of life are primordial. It is woman who goes through the sacred transformations in our own body and psyche. The mystery changes of menstruation, pregnancy, birth, and the production of milk. It is woman who first shaped a seed into food, earth into pottery, fire into a tool, the struggle for survival into human culture, woman as procreator and producer creator. Women's mysteries are blood transformation memory mysteries. The experience of female bodily transformations magically fused with her conscious and willed transformation of matter, matter, the mud, the mother, she transforms herself. Religious rites were combined with industry. Women's religions were organic, a unity of body and spirit, of daily life tasks and cosmic meaning. Among the women weavers of the matrifocal Navajo, for example, this is still so. The women experience themselves as being directly inspired by the great spider woman, the original weaver of the universe. 
They use no set patterns and feel no separation between art, sacred, and craft, secular or profane. The woven blankets are valued as organic expressions of the special powers of the makers. Each blanket with its inspired design has a spiritual significance and is thought of as giving power and protection to the person who wears it. In ancient textiles, a highly charged symbol language was used to communicate her story and myth. Spinning and weaving were imbued with magic powers, and inscribed spindle whorls are found in innumerable, innumerable Neolithic sacrificial pits sacred to the goddess. The Greek Artemis was seen to spin the thread of life, and the three norns of Scandinavian myth mythology sat spinning the web of life, destiny, and fate at the roots of Yggdrasil, the cosmic world tree. The subtle energy form of the human body may be seen as a subtle energy form of the cosmos, relatively miniature, miniature, miniaturized, but no less vast and totally alive. The cosmos that we know is a construction, perception, or projection of the energy currents of our own bodily systems. Cosmic mind and human mind are not essentially different or separate, nor are cosmic body and human body. Woo! Everything is interconnected in a vast webwork of cosmic being, a universal weaving in which each individual thing or life form is a kind of energy knot or interlock in the overall vibrating pattern. The Latin word, the Latin word for religion is religare, which means a bond, a binding back to something. Yoga, interestingly enough, means the same thing, a yoke, a yoking of the individual soul to the all. William Uren Thompson writes, quote, the sacred is the emotional force that connects the part to the whole. The profane or the secular is that which has been broken off from or has fallen from its emotional bond to the universe. Relegare means to bind up, and the traditional task of religion has been to bind up the pieces that have been broken away from the ecstatic oneness, end quote. Whew. True religion is the original umbilical cord that binds our individual selves back to our larger universal source. That source in women's religion is the great mother, who is the great cosmic weaver, the divine potter, the carrier of the heavenly water jar, the carrier of the heavenly water jar. We participate in her substance, her nature, her processes, her play, and her work. In her are both the lower regions of the tomb, the world of the dead, and the upper regions of the celestial sky, whose stars are her eyes. Groundwater belongs to the belly womb region of the lower female. The heavenly rainwater belongs to the great breast region of the upper female. As divine water jar, she, oh my God. <sighs> As divine water jar, she is mistress of the upper waters, the rain, and of the lower waters, the brooks, streams, and rivers flowing from the womb of the earth. The Egyptian sky and water jar goddess Nut nourishes the earth with her milky rain. In fact, our word galaxy comes from the Greek galixis, meaning milky circle, and the Milky Way describes the thick white stream of stars pouring from her breasts. As uterus, she is a vessel that breaks with childbirth, pouring forth water like a wellspring. These are all symbols of creative life and of the ecstatic participation in it. The self-representation of the goddess is a form of divine epiphany, and the parts of her body are not understood literally as physical organs, but as numinous centers of whole spheres of life. Her navel is the center of the earth, of us, from which the universe is nourished by our conscious participation as we are nourished by it. Such symbolism expresses the non-dualistic, poetic mind of ancient women who could experience their bodies as whole world or universes and the universe as their own body. 
Ecstasy is the dance of the individual within the all. Ecstatic means standing outside oneself and so canceling out conditioned mind. Woo! Mm. Ecstatic, ecstatics, ecstasis means standing outside oneself and so canceling out the conditioned mind. All life was experienced as partaking of a material, spiritual wholeness that was her. In this magic unity, ecstasy and responsibility, i.e. responsiveness, were one. And so the earliest communicators with her of her essence were ecstatic women, shamans, and seers. In their trance states, they were responsible for keeping the energy channels open and flowing between each individual, the group, and the cosmic source. They healed, balanced, and translated the life forces from one energy manifestation to another. It is significant that to this day, within almost all the patriarchal world religions, Women's robes are still the official priestly garb and male priest function as a kind of male mother to the believers. Among the Siberian tribes, male shamans have always worn ornamental and symbolic breasts on their robes. When civilized men become the moralistic priests of the new father God, women and pagans of both sexes remain the shamans quote, the witches of the ecstatic mother. The reality implicit in the universe, in each one of us, in the self at the heart of being, is her way. It is very ancient and has no time. Quote, me, excuse me, quote, my me is God, nor do I know myself save in her, end quote. Ecstasy is the only way through which the... Mm, Ecstasy is the only way through which the soul can lose itself in union with her. Some male mystics have also understood this. Martin Buber describes prenatal life as the original state of ecstatic consciousness within a sexual spiritual universe, a flowing toward each other, a bodily reciprocity. The mother's womb is a condensed experience of cosmos. At birth, we forget the undivided world, but we never forget completely. The memory lingers as a secret image of a wish, a desire for total reintegration. Yes, oh my God. A desire for total reintegration. And this is, a real, is the real meaning of the human longing to return to the womb. It is not at all a sign of pathology or inadequacy, not a backwards craving, but an urge to expand, to reestablish the cosmic connection. Temporary, let me mark this page, because I am teaching a workshop on this book, and every time I read it, I um, see something different. Pages, because I am teaching this book twice a month, and where are my stickers? Damn it. Um, let me just mark the page. And I have to be formulating questions for those of you who participate. So that is why the um, pause for the cause. Sorry. I just need to mark this page with a sticker or something. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah, so I'll read that last sentence again. It is not at all a sign of pathology or inadequacy, not a backward craving, but an urge to expand, to reestablish the cosmic connection. Contemporary researchers have found neurological connections between religious or trance experience and female sexuality. In women's brains, there are unique neural links between the forebrain and the, cere and the cerebellum which allows sensations of physical pleasure to be directly integrated into the neocortex or high brain center. This explains why some women experience orgasm so intense that they enter religious trance or altered states of consciousness. 
and this ecstatic female orgasmic experience in which the physical and spiritual are fused and realized as one is at the core of all mystical experience. This is why in the original religion of the great mother, body and mind and spirit are always integrated. Because human males' brains do not seem to have these neurological connections, just as human male sexuality has not evolved radically beyond primate sexuality, while human females, through the shift from estrus to menstrual cycles, have evolved a non-reproductive sexual capacity that functions primarily for effect uh, affectional bonding. The researchers conclude, y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> The researchers conclude it is women who must take the lead in further human evolution toward the integration of the conscious and the unconscious mind and to a more profound understanding of the spiritual nature of the species. What these modern researchers are now discovering is something ancient women have always known. The warring dualisms of matter versus spirit the hostile antagonisms of sexual body versus religious truth are recent patriarchal inventions destructively forced on the world and the soul. They had no place at the beginning of things for they are neither natural nor true for women at any rate, they can never be true. And that is why the first religion originated by women was a sexual spiritual religion, the celebration of cosmic ecstasy. Among these early women, though some may some more receptive psyches might have acted as shamanistic trans channels, we can imagine no real leaders, no followers, no hierarchies, just as there were no hierarchic distinction made between ordinary daily tasks and the most exalted rituals, because we can see these women sharing experience as a kind of ecstatic rite in and of itself. They knew life as an ecstatic rite and as their right to ecstasy. That is the end of chapter seven. Female, chapter eight, females cos female cosmology, the creation of the universe. The universe exists as a sleeping darkness, unknowable, unknown, wholly immersed in deep, sleep does she dream and sleep or only when she's only when she wakes we know not she sleeps and then in her sleep the divine self appears with passionate creative power she stirs dispelling darkness she who is subtle and full of desire imperceptible and everywhere now and eternal who contains all created beings wakes then the world stirs when she slumbers tranquilly the universe sinks into a deep sleep. Thus she, the imperishable one, who seems always perishing, always changing, alternate, alternatively waking and sleeping, incessantly revivifies and destroys the whole of creation. She is the dark night and the black soil that holds within itself the intense powers of light the secrets and the forces of all life. She is the mouth, the vagina, the passionate and wise choice from, all, from which all comes and to which all returns. The black, the black winged knight laid a silver egg, the moon, the womb of darkness in the dark waters. The divine one resided in that egg during a whole year. Then she, by herself, alone, divided into two halves, and out of these halves, she formed heaven and earth. The Most Holy One created the world like an embryo. As an embryo grows from the navel, so she began to create the world by the navel, and from there it spread and grew and multiplied in all directions. She was both seed and flower, both primordial and, and final, the first vibrations of the egg of the world, which unfolds to the edges of the universe are both expanding and contracting, emerging from the source and pulsing outward toward outward to disappear into a spherical vortex. Still the center, the heart, is the axis of creation. 
The universal continuum perpetually unfolds, pulses outward, contracts, perpetually spinning through its own center. The egg is a symbol of female creation, female generative power. At the pole of contraction, our universe existed as an invisible point of dark light, of compacted potential and energy. This was the world egg. The spiral movement that creates a center and a moving, continuous whole is also that which combined with gravitational contraction creates the solar system and the atom. On a large scale, the galaxy. Galaxies seem to be created by the inward spiraling of interstellar gas and the outward spiraling of heat. The same vort vortical laws govern the movements of water, which, compo uh, which composes nearly three quarters of our physical bodies and three quarters of the physical body of the earth. Water is pure potential, an unformed matrix from which all life on earth takes its being. Water that is not a thing, but a flow, a dance. It is from the involution of the unformed, but forming waters that the egg crystallizes, takes shape, by the turning in on itself of energy, of matter, of consciousness. The macrocosmic cyclic and spiraling movements are mirrored in the, in the, cycling, cy in the spiraling cycles of the human microcosm. Our waking and sleeping, our sexuality and solitude, our emotions, our wisdom, our conceptions of time itself, which move continuously around an unmoved center. <laughs> All these ideas of the original goddess were incorporated into ancient Hindi belief and are now and, and are contained within modern physics and physical cosmogony. Within later Hindu thought, the goddess Shakti Kali, joined with the god Shiva, dances the world into creation continuously, orgiastically expanding and contracting together. But the spiral and later the labyrinth are everywhere and from the beginning associated with her original cosmology. All religions and cosmology in all their forms originate in the great laws of life spiraling around the mystery center of creation. Quote, the mysteries of life, birth and death, violence, love and beauty, out of body tearing, blood pain, comes tenderness in a whisper said love from created being. End quote. In later Hindi, Hindu mysticism, the egg is identified as, as male generative energy. Whenever you come upon something like this, stop and ponder. If it is absurdly inorganic, male gods brooding on the waters or laying eggs, then you know you are in the presence of an original goddess cosmology stolen and displaced by later patriarchal scribes. That is the end of chapter eight. Chapter nine, the cosmic serpent. This, this is a Pelasgian creation myth. Quote, in the beginning, Eronime, the goddess of all things, rose naked from chaos, but found nothing substantial for her feet to rest upon, and therefore divided the sea from the sky dancing lonely upon its waves. She danced towards the south, and the wind set in motion behind her seemed as something new and apart with which to begin the work of creation. Wheeling about, she caught hold of this north wind, rubbed it between her hands, and behold, the great serpent, Ophian, the great serpent, Ophian. Iraname danced to warm herself, wildly and more wildly, until Ophian, Grew, grown lustful, coiled about those divine limbs and was moved to couple with her. So she was with child, end quote. This Pelasian Pal 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 myth is much older than Greek legend. Still, it comes from the transition period when the great mother is no longer believed to give birth parthenogenetically. This is now a perception of the male part in conception. In this myth, Euronyme is fertilized by the north wind, 
The wind is the subtle body of the serpent. Its movements through air, its movements through the air. Ultimately, though, she is still seen as a character of male sexual energy. The generative force of the wind and the great serpent as an emanation from herself, from her passion and her dance. Great live snakes were everywhere, kept in the goddesses' temples during the Neolithic. In wall paintings, bas reliefs, statues, she was, also, she was often represented carrying snakes in her hands, upraised arms, and coiled around her. Or she was imaged as a serpent herself with a, with a woman's body and a snake's head. Or, let's say, one of near east, one of near, of one Near Eastern goddess, it is said, Pagat, this is a quote, by the way, Pagat, she who observes the water, who studies the dew from the drop, who knows the courses of the stars, her heart is like a serpent, end quote. The Sumerian goddess was known as the great mother serpent of heaven, perhaps another image of the Milky Way, the great spiraling galactic arms. Everywhere in world myth and imagery, the goddess creatrix was coupled with the sacred serpent. In Egypt, she was the cobra goddess. The use of the cobra and her ceremonies and icons were so ancient that the inscribed picture of a cobra preceded the names of all the goddesses and became the hieroglyphic sign for the word goddess itself. Isis also pictured as a serpent goddess. Far away in Australia, the aboriginal goddess Una, who established the earth, was pictured sometimes as three sisters with the rainbow snake held up in her arms. And this is a Venezuelan creation myth from the native Yararus. This is a quote. At first there was nothing. Then Poana, the snake, who came first, created the world and everything in it. Kuma was the first person to people the land. Everything sprang from Kuma and everything that the Yararos do was established by her, end quote. Australia, Venezuela, the ancient Middle East, the distribution of the goddess and her serpent is global. On South Pacific islands with no snakes, the eel is mythologized. Ancient Celtic and Teutonic goddesses were wrapped with, were wrapped with snakes. The Chinese celebrated dragon power and the Aztec and Maya of Mexico and Central America imaged the feather serpent or flying snake, a form of dragon. Both the monumental Karnak of Egypt and the mysterious standing stone alignment called Karnak in Brittany are magic snake alignments. Both names mean serpent's mounts. When we see the worldwide occurrence of the goddess and her serpent, and then recall the ancient African black goddess, the black witch, imaged with a snake in her belly, we can see the profound power as well as universality of this cosmological symbol, its range of endurance in the human mind. And we begin to see why the upstart patriarchal religions base themselves on the utter destruction of the goddess serpent pictured in the Babylonians as, pri as um, primal, primal chaos, an image picked up later by the Hebrews and used in the biblical Genesis, where Eve, linked with her serpent, became the symbols of ontological evil. Among patriarchal Hebrews, the serpent was portrayed as Samuel, the brother of the evil first woman Lilith. When Old Testament reformers like he uh, Hezekiah went around destroying, quote, brazen serpents, serpents, cult images made of brass as pagan abominations, what they were really doing was attacking the primordial goddess religion followed by all their neighbors. The Hebrew patriarchs tried to destroy the world's original, most widespread and enduring religion by branding it as evil and by portraying the mother goddess and her magic serpent, her magic snake lover as the source, not of all life, but of all wickedness hated and condemned by their new tribal god, Yahweh. To the, to the degree that they were historically successful in this attempt, Western biblicized peoples have lost their original concept and memory of what goddess and her serpent really meant to all people at all times. The snake was first of all a symbol of eternal life, like the moon, since each time it shed its skin, it seemed reborn. It represented 
cosmic continuity within the natural change, spiritual continuity within the changes of material life. Gliding as it does in and out of holes and caverns in the earth, the serpent also symbolized the underground, the abode of the dead who wait for rebirth. Its, un its undulation symbolized the serpentine earth currents of the underground waters. The serpent path on earth was the terrestrial energy flow. The serpent path in the sky was the winding spray of stars in the galactic spiral arm or the Milky Way. The connection between snakes and birds is evolutionary. The bird species evolved directly out of reptile species, the shining scales becoming feathers. Some snakes are born alive, but reptiles generally and many snakes lay eggs as do birds. And the egg belongs to the goddess. The formation of the world and of life itself took its beginnings from a double egg, the chromosome and its polar body. In the midst, <clears throat> in the midst of which a germ resided, the life embryo. Some of the most ancient Paleolithic engraved and sculpted goddess images show her as a divine water bird with a long snaky phallic neck and bearing the cosmic double egg in her protruding buttocks. So expressing in the upper stone age, a non-physical reality through these material symbols of becoming. The mystery of, early, of earthly life has its origin in water in oceans, deep lakes, shallow pools, cave grottoes, streams, and rivers, in the sea-like pulse and taste of blood. Before a child is born, water flows out of the ruptured womb ocean within the mother. The very ancient bird-clawed and horned goddess was born in the womb of the myth myth mythical waters. The cosmic egg was created by the cosmic horned or lunar snake or laid by a mythic water bird both bird and snake vehicles of energy, which has its source both evolutionarily and magical in terrestrial water. She is one, she is two, mistress of the waters and sky and air. In Egypt, in Babylon, in Crete, India, and ancient Europe, it is believed that her abode is beyond the upper waters, beyond the meandrous labyrinths. She was ruler over the waters on earth, in the skies, and beyond the clouds, where the primordial waters flow. To represent all of this, the bird and snake goddess was pictured. Her body is decorated with snake spirals, her arms and legs are snakes, her eyebrows are horned, and the magical source of life, the double egg, lies within her. The goddess was also, was also she who gives life to the dead aided by her magic serpent who winds in and out of the earthly tomb womb. The snake, with its stylized image, the spiral was seen as the vehicle of immortality and the image of spontaneous life energy, its continuous flow. The snake could shed its skin but still live, and the moon birthed herself from her own darkness, and the womb bled periodically without being wounded all were seen as miraculously interconnected transformations. To the, serpent, um, to the serpent was attributed power that can move the entire cosmos and does. The cosmic snake winds over and around the cosmic egg like a continuous flow of water, of energy. The beginning of life within the egg is caused by the orbiting of snakes within it, their interaction causing and sustaining tension field, which becomes form. The symbolism of snake, egg, horns, fish, and doe, along with the female images of vulva, triangles, spiraling circles, all related to water, originate in Stone Age times. Uh, all related to water, originate in Stone Age times. Egg-shaped sculptures, sculptures with the vulva engraved on them have been dated from circa 6,000 BC. The horned rams and bulls of Neolithic ritual were sacrificed to the ancient bird and snake goddess. Mirija Gimbutas uh, points out that the 6th millennia BC saw centuries of drought. And from this comes an obsession with rain and water symbolism, which is everywhere present in ritual, on vessels, and in ideograms of that time. The snake spiral was the basis of, basis of ornamental composition in ancient Europe its peak expression being circa 5,000 BC. 
So we have here some extremely ancient and mysterious connections for psychic resonances involving snakes, spirals, waters and tides, menstrual periods, the moon, the dead, auricular powers, psychic healing, bisexuality, the magnetic earth current, the womb, the stars, immortality, and ever renewed life. In Africa, snake issuing, snakes issuing from the nostrils indicated clairvoyant powers. I'll just show you right here. There's actually a bronze female head from Benin, Nigeria, with snakes issuing from the nostrils and birds on the head. If you can see that image there, right? If you can see that image there. <clears throat> so in Africa, snakes issuing from the nostrils indicated clairvoyant powers, doubtless related to the third eye the pineal gland behind the nose, and the snake hair of Medusa had the same significance. One legendary historic Medusa was an Amazonian queen in the region of present-day Morocco, Algeria, North Africa. According to Merlin Stone, snake venom injected into people who, who have previously been immunized against it has highly hallucinogenic qualities. Some venom is chemically similar to mescaline or peyote or to psilocybin of mushrooms. Reported effects were clairvoyance, extraordinary mental powers, enhanced creativity, prophetic visions, illumination about the uh, primal processes of existence. As Stone remarks, the sacred snakes kept at the goddess's auricular shrines were perhaps not merely the symbols, but actually the instruments through which the experiences of divine revelation were reached. And so the Egyptian cobra goddess was also known as the lady of spells. We can be sure the ancient women shamans worldwide were aware of this property of snake venom. And that this was one of the recognized meanings of snake symbols and images inscribed everywhere. Rudolf Steiner, or Rudolf Steiner, founder of anthropos anthroposophy, spoke of the innate clairvoyant power of ancient humanity, a power lost by modern man, who is now unaware of his primordial connection with universal life and its magic energies. Reduced to a mere, oh my God, reduced to a mere mechanism Excuse me while I make notes. Reduced to a mere mechanism, a physical recording apparatus. Oh my God. Ugh. Reduced to a mere mechanism, a physical recording apparatus. He lives in a void of utter loneliness and alienation. For it is precisely the astral lunar region, astral lunar region, the psychic world of supersensual perception, called by occultists the astral serpent, which patriarchy tells us to destroy, to overcome in the name of an abstract, static, asexual, hyperrational, mechanistic system. Finally, the snake came to symbolize the phallus male sexual energy, which was understood to be originally contained inside the goddess, born from her and returning to her again, when at the end of each world cycle, expansion and contraction, she coils up into dark sleep. Though upper paleolithic images of copulation between women and men occur, icons and myths of the great mother do not show her actually mated with a human son with a human sun lover until middle Neolithic times, circa 5,500 BC. At this time, and especially after the peak period of the Katal Hayuk, there seems to have begun a divorce of male attributes from the mother and quite a phallic obsession developed, shown in representations of phallic cups, standing phallic stones, and ithophallic goddesses, uh, ithophallic gods. Oh my God. I might lose my Facebook viewers, you guys. Hold on just a second. Uh, let's see if I can remedy this real quick. Okay. Mm, here we go. Maybe that will work. My 
might have to just move it. Someday soon, this will function like a well-oiled machine. In the meantime, where was I? The male obsession with the phallus. Let's see. <clears throat> um, and the ithophallic gods through pictures of shamans in trance with huge erections. Oh my God. <laughs> Go back far into the upper Paleolithic. Ah. Uh, But these are not aggressive or misogynistic phallic images. Rather, they seem to represent the phallus serving the goddess, women, and the life processes of all. This is really shown in the tradition of goddess phallus stones, with a goddess figure carved on phallic-shaped bones or rocks. This phallic form of the goddess is found continuously from the Paleolithic through the, uh, through the Neolithic and into the proto-urban period of Mesopotamia. Marija, uh, Marija Gumbatus, Gumbutas sees these phallus, goddess phallus icons deriving from the old stone age as suggesting the androgynous nature of the great mother. This is so. They also suggest the potential unity of the sexes in mutual love service before their disastrous splitting apart by patriarchal misogyny and puritanical sex codes. Oh, oh my God. At any rate, from the period of patriarchal cosmological texts, circa 4,000 to 3,000 BC, the serpent comes down to us as a narrowed and pejorative symbol of male sexuality or immoral sex and of evil. The Egyptians believed that from the union of chaos and the wind, life breath, the all goddess dancing with her own breath, came forth Ma'at in the form of an egg. <clears throat> Ma'at was the Egyptian word for both mother and matter. It was the primordial mud of the Nile from which life grew. It also meant truth and justice and was often symbolized by a feather and a vulture. The feather weighed in the balanced scales against the soul at death and the vulture mother who swoops down to pick the dead bones clean for rebirth. My aunt, as the ultimate truth contained within herself the potential existence and non-existence of all things, all polarities. She, also, she was also pure nothingness having no identifiable characteristics, but the eternal potency and potential of everything. Another symbol for this same complex, uh, complex of ideas is the Ouroboros. Ouroboros, the serpent coiled with its tail in its own mouth, forming a perfect circle, or female O, or zero, the cycle of all and of nothing. The continuous eternal wisdom cycle of all coming from nothing and returning to nothing again. The hallucinated dream cycle of sleep, waking and sleep, and who can say which is the dream and which is not. That is the end of chapter eight, I think. Or was that nine? It was nine. Okay, and this is the last chapter I will be reading this evening. And I want to thank you all for hanging in there with me. This last chapter is the world egg the yin and yang. The ancient great mother of all living gave birth parthenogenetically to herself and the entire cosmos. She was the world egg to contain, uh, containing the two halves of all polarities or dualisms, the yin yang of continuity and change, expansion and contraction of the universe. This process is symbolized by the spiral turning continuously in on itself by conscious breath waking from sleep and sinking back into sleep, Kali or Uranome, uh, dancing the universe into being and then destruction and death. The ascending spiral is matter transforming into spiritual psychic energy. Simultaneously, whew, simultaneously from the descending spiral, 
the materialization of the spirit, comes the differentiation of the whole manifest world. The spiral involution of energy into matter is the primary movement of the universe into created beings. The spiral evolution of matter into energy is the creative movement of these beings, con uh, consciously evolving back to their source. Inhaling and exhaling breaths of living cosmos spirals the universe into creation and dissolution. Energy to matter, world to spirit, radiant energy can be transformed into massive particles and vice versa. The spiral is the symbolic key to immortality or eternal process and is identified with the moon. Ancient as this, ancient as this cosmology is, it remains the most accurate statement of cosmic process yet made. 20th century physicists, using their very different mathematical language, have only been able to confirm these ancient conceptions of how the universe creates and recreates itself. The world, the world egg's two halves were white and black, light and dark, day and night, hot and cold, life and death. It contained within itself all oppositions, but it also stated the union of opposites as the continuum is contained and synthesized within the spiral. In the Orient, some early time in the millennia before our era, this idea was formalized in the concept of the yin and yang. Yin, or the negative principle, originally referred to the dark or shadow side of a mountain. It shared attributes with the earth, moon, and water. Yang, or the positive principle, signifying bright banners in the wind or the light side of the mountain, which linked with the sky, sun, and fire. After several generations of Eastern philosophers, every, uh, everything became classified under these categories, including the sexes. Yin was female, yang was male. But the Eastern dualism differed originally from the moralistic dualism of the Christian West. Yin and yang were not seen as hostile and irreconcilable opposites, vying for control over the universe, nor was one good or the other evil. On the contrary, yin and yang constantly complement each other to maintain cosmic harmony. And they are not fixed, static principles, but transform each other and transmute into each other and in, in an ongoing process. Without the eternal movements and interchanges of these forces, life could not exist. Winter, which is yin, changes into summer, which is yang. Both yin and yang can create, both can destroy. The life-giving sun, which can also scorch and kill life, gives way to the dark, bearing coal of the earth, which new, new life seeds will invisibly germinate. The yin-yang images and, con and conceptual categories are pagan from the land, since they emerge from the close prolonged experience and observation of natural processes. These processes are not linear, but cyclic. Life transmutes into death, which turns into life again in a great revolving wheel. The moon goes through its changes, dies, and is reborn because it circles in a circling cosmos. And so the moon, like the serpent, is the avatar of these processes. The psychic focus is not on the mutual antagonisms, but on the subtle interchanges and permutations, the dance of these polarities. Later, Mandarin philosophers like Confucius used the yin and yang principles to serve hierarchic the, the hierarchic politics of the Chinese court and the patriarchal state emphasizing dominant yang over submissive yin. Earlier Taoists, though, gave full value to the negative force, or shadow side yin, as a creative power equal to yang. Taoism, a mystic and sexual religious philosophy, originated in ancient Chinese matriarchy, which saw the male as the earth animal and the female as the animal of change or transforming people. The original I Ching characters for the female and male principles, the receptive and creative hexagrams, contain these matrifocal meanings also. As Western alchemists and the later Western physicists were to confirm, it is the negative pole that initiates the creative activity of matter. Some physicists theorize that the universe began to organize, gathering shape and motion, 
in the shadow sides of randomly scattered particles. Also, until recently, scientists have assumed that the weight of the universe was in bright stars and speedy particles. But now they have found enormous amounts of dark, cold matter circling the stars and all galactic bodies. And this matter is, um, is preponderant and responsible for the weight of the entire universe, which functions as gravity. As they report, the structure of the whole universe appears to be shaped by the gravity of dark matter. What has been called the dark, the negative, the female in both the celebratory and the pejorative senses is now seen to be the original creating and sustaining force of the universe. If life expanding, if the, if, if the expanding universe is ever to contract again, it will be from the gravity of this dark matter. The corruption of the original yin-yang auricular, um, auricular mystical synthesis into a dualistic system of hierarchy, dominance, and oppression occurred in the East as in the West. In the shift of human culture from land tribal to court hierarchic, i.e. in the shift from matrifocal rural to patrifocal urban social structures. In the patriarchal struggle for property and power, the yin and yang equation became a tool, a weapon of inequality and repression, both economic and sexual. Now the yin as receptive feminine was interpreted as sexual, intellectual, and spiritual passivity, inferiority, and subordination. Yang as an active as active masculine was interpreted as sexual, intellectual, spiritual aggression, superiority, and dominance. In the West, also these religiously institutionalized sexual dualisms have created the ideal of heterosexual patriarchal marriage in which a sexually oppressed and economically dependent quote wife serves as a sexually and economically uh, serves a sexually and economically dominant husband. These concepts are highly political and serve to maintain and justify patriarchy and the subjugation of women. Yin wisdom is scorned by men as irrational weakness and yang power is used to justify any kind of exploitative action, um, exploitative action, no matter how unjust or brutal. But these are not the original meanings of these terms. The original meanings apply to the interworkings of, ra of rather impersonal and certainly non-domestic forces, much like the negative and positive electrical poles in a battery. As our uh, as R. Buckminster Fuller put it, energy, this is a quote, energy, when its potential is built to a sufficient voltage, must arc over the dominant negative, end quote. And that, my dears, is the end of chapter 10. So I will end the reading here tonight, there. Um, I will pick up again tomorrow, and tomorrow we will read um, the chap uh, chapter 11, which is the Gyandrus Great Mother. This is a game changing chapter. All the questions that are front and center these days about gender, um, uh, about gender and about sex and about sexuality, all in these coming chapters. So I think we're, um, the coming chapters are still relatively short. So we'll probably read another four chapters tomorrow evening. For those of you, in this, if this is the first time that you're tuning in, like I said from the beginning, I will be reading this book for those that are just tuning in, The Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth by Monica Zhu and Barbara Moore. I will be reading this book every night um, except Sunday evenings until the book is complete. And, um, and then the first and third Saturday of every month, I will be hosting a book club study on the chapters that we've read the weeks prior. And I will be emailing out to those who are interested. If you look in the, um, if you're tuning in on YouTube and you look in the description, excuse me, the link to the um, Facebook book club is in the description below. So if you just go there and sign into the book club, if you are interested in participating in the classes that I'll be teaching twice a month, then you will get prompt questions. So I'll be conducting it just like a political education where I will develop based on the reading um, prompt questions of 
uh, content in those chapters that I think are vital for you to draw out of each of the readings that we do. So um, those, those um, workshops, those classes happen every first and third Sunday of the month. Um, also, if you go into my YouTube page and look um, at the videos that I have made, I have a live that I just did a few days ago promoting another workshop that I'm going to be leading. That's going to be every single Saturday for the next seven weeks, starting this weekend on the significance to um, people of color, brown, red, black, yellow people on the significance of America's first Pluto returns, which will be happening very, very soon, February 20th, uh, 2022. And what we need to do to prepare for the change in guard. Okay. So check out that video, check out the link in the description below to uh, sign up for the, the study group for this wonderful game changing life transformative book the Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth by Monica, uh, Monica Zhu and Barbara Moore. Until tomorrow night, I want to thank you all again for bearing with my little technological glitch at the beginning and sticking with me until the end of the read. I hope it was as impactful for you as it was for me. I will see you again. This is Yapo Moyende Angina, also known as Cassandra. So see you tomorrow night. Bye.